In early spring I planted kale in my protected raised bed by broadcasting the seeds, later thinning out the majority of plantlets to leave only a few to grow to maturity. By adding a fresh layer of grass clippings as mulch weekly, the kale kept producing leaves daily. Although by late summer, as is customary, they began being afflicted by pests. I kept an eye over them, removing caterpillars and eggs often. And so I had it keep producing lots of leaves throughout the growing season. If you stop to think about the sheer abundance that nature provides, it's mind-boggling. Think about it. I got these for just a little extra effort and some seeds. If I were to pay for organic kale in the market, a bunch like this would be more than almost three dollars, two ninety nine, and I have here already closer to thirty dollars worth, just market value. But there's nothing that quite that quite matches the satisfaction of growing your own food. That's priceless. I this is just one one harvest. There will be many more to come. So if you want to have a healthier life, that's more connected, that you feel a sense of purpose to nature, start growing your own food. Sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's really easy. Keeping the pests at bay was in fact the most laborious part of growing these, especially after the work of setting up and building the raised beds. Other than that, raising kale was easy. It was a reliable staple for homegrown greens. I was able to take a few leaves daily for salad, besides the larger harvests like this one. I wouldn't be able to consume all of this anytime soon, so I decided to preserve the kale by dehydrating them. I don't have a fancy dehydrator, so I use my regular oven. While it is not the best setup to dehydrate food, it works well for kale. I double check the leaves for any remaining caterpillars that may have escaped picking before and lay the leaves directly on the oven rack. I then turn the oven on on the lowest heat setting possible and place the rack inside. An oven's lowest temperature will typically be still too high for proper dehydration, so I wedge the handle of a spoon to prop the oven door open, allowing extra heat and humidity to escape. About 20 minutes later, I had very crunchy dehydrated kale ready to be stirred in a closed jar. The leaves must shatter when you touch them. If they bend, they are not dried enough and may spoil. Since they mostly kept their green color and were not brown, I knew that they had not overcooked or burned. I plan to use them during winter in soups and stews to add nutrition. While kale can survive the cold, during deep winter they stop growing, so it is a good idea to have a backup in your pantry. About a week after my first major harvest thinning out the kale plants, the bed looked lush and full again, sporting large, deep green leaves. I'll be back right after this commercial. Thinning out the plants have absolutely worked for the kale. They've flushed out a second batch of leaves, and the size of the leaves is just much bigger than before. I've been careful to go through every day or actually every other day or every three three days and try to find any of the caterpillars that have been eating it and mostly I've been able to control doesn't mean there is there are no caterpillars in fact I do see one right here I have to take it out but if you keep doing that it's possible to control if you have just a few plants if you're just taking care of the plants you need and if you keep picking at it there's a greater possibility or there's a greater probability that you're also taking out eggs as you harvest it and that way you keep the population controlled. If you don't then caterpillars can eat everything but the one thing I do I'm not as annoyed with caterpillars is because they if you keep them in control they usually as far as I know don't don't transmit any disease that can systemically kill the plant. So as long as they're not eating too much of the plant, you should be fine. Different from things like the cucumber beetle that just devastates the whole crop because of virus or, or some kind of wilt. 
course, it may be easier to spray things with a chemical pesticide and that way control the, the larva and whatever other insect. And you can even use organic ones, such as uh, neem oil. And while they do have their place, I try to do Beyond Organic and wherever I can, I try to use just manual control or cultivation practices because that way I'm more, it's a more tailored solution even though it's more labor intensive, but it has absolutely no residue. When you use even an organic um, pesticide like neem oil, you will be killing more than just the, the insects that cause problems, in this case, the worms. You will also be killing beneficial insects. And I've seen actually some large spiders around here. And I know that the spiders are a gardener's friend. They'll go after the small insects that we may not even be seeing that could be causing issues. And that way, by keeping the beneficial insects around, you have the ecosystems um, controlling potential problems. And again, trying to keep your plant as healthy as possible, giving it whatever it needs to grow, keeping the soil mulched seems to be good preventive care. As much as with health, prevention seems to be a very important um, point in gardening. If you can prevent issues, it's better than having to remedy them. Of course, there comes a time that pest pressures just increases, especially towards the, the end of summer, when especially hard to quim bugs, in the case of kale, they just attack and they eat everything, and it's hard to control them manually. In those cases, I just let things go, and I try to plant seasonally according to the things that will grow best to that season. And there's always something that does spectacular at that time of the year that would struggle some more some other time. So if you can grow seasonally and eat seasonally, that way you'll have food that's beyond organic, food that's truly natural. To be fair, my kale leaves did have several little holes in them from the caterpillars as well as the odd grasshopper. At this point in the season, in late summer, they no longer looked as pristine as in the beginning of spring, but overall they looked healthy. I personally don't mind a bit of insect damage here and there. I'm not growing for a market, just myself, so the look is not as important. I suppose there are people who rather have their kill doused with chemicals they can't see rather than have damage from insects they may find. To be frank, these caterpillars have lived their whole lives on these plants, never even setting foot on the ground. I just make sure to remove them and wash the leaves thoroughly before eating when needed. Controlling this pest by hand takes more effort and perseverance, but if you make checking all your kale plants in almost daily routine, it will become 15 minutes of restoring work on your garden every other day. In truth, it's quite relaxing. If you don't have the time to spend with manual control, or you want to grow more than just a few plants, you can take up other organic actions to control the cabbage caterpillars. I've heard that you can spray your plants with Bt, which is an organic solution where you introduce bacteria that is host specific that will attack only the cabbage caterpillar while leaving other insects alone. It is also harmless to other animals, including humans. The other option is to prevent the white butterflies from depositing eggs on your kale by flying in and landing on them. You can also use a row cover, which is a light translucent textile installed over hoops to prevent bugs from reaching your plants. After several hot and humid weeks in late August, I skipped going to the garden and the kale soon was overtaken by holes as the caterpillars bounced back in numbers, but I did not give up and kept removing them. If you're using row covers, you must install them early on before the white butterflies start visiting the garden. You must also make sure that there are no holes whereby bugs can enter. The downside of row covers is that they are synthetic fibers and using them will increase plastic pollution. By October, I was gaining back control and I was happy that the harlequin bugs had not grown in any appreciable number, something I struggled with in my last garden. By November, the first frost came and I knew that this would kill off the remaining caterpillars and I would have kale growing all winter long and hopefully a big harvest in early spring before they flowered.